Thank you and a very pleasant greeting, ladies and gentlemen. I am Gary Colley, Evangelist of the Church of Christ, and it's such a pleasure for me to greet you today with the Gospel of Christ. This, of course, is our Bible class hour, Fundamentals of Christianity. And we're so delighted that so many are listening to the broadcast and certainly hopeful that these lessons will be advantageous to you and helpful in every way. It is our desire to open the truth of the gospel so that we might enlighten people who may be in error or who may be following a false doctrine. It's always our pleasure then to study with you. We're hopeful that you have your Bible and your pencil and your paper handy and that you will take notes of the things which we describe and talk about today. Our lesson today shall deal with whether or not a child of God can fall from the grace of God. This important subject, of course, stands in opposition to those who talk about the security of the believer. They believe that the believer is secure, that he can commit any sin that he wants to commit, and that still he is saved no matter what may be said or done. It is also said that we're once saved, always saved by some, but the Bible, of course, does not teach that doctrine. Paul said in Romans 1.14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and unto the foolish. And so as much as is in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you also who are at Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also unto the Greek. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. These verses, of course, describe why Paul was a preacher. And they describe his indebtedness because of the shed blood of our Savior upon the cross. The same thing that made him a debtor makes us a debtor, to teach as many people as we possibly can the right ways of the Lord. It is also said here that the gospel is God's power to save. But, of course, if men are saved without the gospel, there was no need to give the gospel. Or if they're once saved, always saved, then, of course, there is no need to preach the gospel. Why would we continue to preach and warn people of the impending destruction of the end of the world if there were no way that they could fall from the grace of God? But let us discuss those things today and understand thoroughly what the Bible teaches on this subject. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, beginning in verse 1 and reading several verses down, Paul said, would I, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat of the same spiritual food and did all drink of the same spiritual drink, for that drink was the spirit of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Howbeit with them God was not well pleased, for they were, not, they were overthrown in the wilderness. And then he goes on to say, these things happened for our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after those things which they also lusted after. Neither should we be idolaters as some of them were, and they, the, as it is written, the people did sit down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day twenty and three thousand. Neither let us make trial of the Lord, as some of them made trial, and perished of the serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and perished by the destroyer. Now these things happened unto them by way of example, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let a man that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now, this, of course, is a warning by the Apostle Paul, who wrote to the Corinthian brethren, Let us take heed, lest we fall. He would not warn about falling if there were no way for a man to fall. But indeed, this gives us the idea that we can fall from the grace of God. Actually, those very words are used in the Scriptures. In Galatians 5 and verse 4, he said, Christ has become of non-effect unto you. That is, no use, no advantage, that Christ's death, burial, and resurrection are in vain, if indeed you are justified by the law. He said, ye are fallen from grace. Now, this was because they renounced the gospel for that old law of Moses. 
They wanted to continue in circumcision and the things of that law. Some, of course, would argue with Paul today because he said you can fall from grace, and these brethren did. But they would say, no, you have the security of the believer. You cannot fall from grace. And so because of that, we need to study and discuss this lesson, do we not? Now let's ask first of all, were the children of Israel God's children? In Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, he said, For well, thou art a holy people unto Jehovah thy God. Jehovah thy God hath chosen thee to be a people of his own possession, and above all peoples that are upon the face of the earth. In Deuteronomy 14, verses 1 and 2, Ye, he said, are the children of Jehovah your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make baldness between your eyes for the dead. For thou art a holy people unto Jehovah thy God. And as Jehovah hath chosen thee to be a people for his own possession above all peoples that are upon the face of the earth. Yes, then, my friends, they were the children of God. They were a holy people. They were a chosen possession and they were ranked above all in God's sight. What a wonderful thing then to notice they were God's children. But then let us ask again, where and how many Israelites fell in one day? In Numbers 25, verses 1 through 4, he said, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Now you remember that this was at the advice of Balaam. He was wanting to turn them away from God in a base, religious, heathenistic custom. And so because of that, he said they were called the people, uh, they called the people unto sacrifice for their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Israel. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them up unto Jehovah before the sun, that the fierce anger of Jehovah may turn away from Israel. My friends, these people not only could fall, they did fall. They were the children of God, but they played the harlot with the daughters of Moab. And that, of course, because Balaam advised them to do so. In the 10th chapter of number, or 1 Corinthians, verses 1 through 12, we notice that here 20 and 3,000 perished in one day because they went against the commandments of the Lord. And so because of that, we understand these people not only could fall, they did fall. Now, if one is a child, can he ever cease to be a child? Numbers 14, verse 11 and 12 reads this way. Jehovah said unto Moses, How long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me for all the signs which I have wrought among them? I will smite them with a pestilence. I will disinherit them and will make thee a nation greater and mightier than they. Moses pleads with Jehovah to pardon them in verses 13 through 19. Now God is going to destroy these people because they have turned away from him. But he says, I will disinherit them. One may be a child of God then and be disinherited. And if he is disinherited, he no longer receives the blessings that God has to give. We have children in this life. We love them dearly. But they may so act that we decide to remove them from our will. We may disinherit them because they do not continue in the principles and the conduct that we expect them to continue in. Well, that's exactly what happened here. He was disinheriting them because they were not doing his will. This is a threat unto Israel. Well, can a child of God do the works of the flesh? These who contend that man cannot fall from grace, they must contend that God does not have a, a work of the flesh against which he brings his wrath. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, now the works of the flesh are manifest, or they are plain, they're well known. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, impurity and lasciviousness and lewdness, of course, idolatry, which is false religion, witchcraft and hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, 
that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Can a child of God do these things? Well, of course they can. Will they inherit the kingdom of God if they do? No, my friends, this is quite evident here. Paul said, I've told you before, and I'm going to tell you again, that they which practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, a child of God can do the works of the flesh, therefore he can fall from grace. Why is it that Paul would then warn, take heed lest you fall? 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let a man that thinketh he standeth, remember, take heed lest he fall. I wouldn't have to warn you about falling if there was no danger of you falling. If you were standing on a, on a high mountain and I said, take heed lest you fall, that would be a warning, would it not? That you might fall. And if there were no possibility of you falling, there would be no need for the warning. Paul gave the warning because they could fall from grace. But let's go further. If one cannot fall from grace, what, what about Phineas? What about his act in Numbers 25? In verse 6 through 8 of Numbers 25, And behold, the Bible says, One of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel while they were weeping at the door of the tent of meeting. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, when he saw it, he rose up in the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the pavilion. And he thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Now here he is showing respect for God's authority and for Moses. When this one brought in this Midianite woman and was going to have fornication with her, then God, of course, was not allowing that, and it would have brought greater harm to Israel. So Phinehas took upon himself to go after these two in their sin. Well, what is the state of those who so sin as these did? First of all, my friends, he can't go to heaven because we read just a moment ago that that will not be allowed in heaven and that those who practice such things without repentance cannot possibly enter into the blessings of heaven. Well, if he could go to heaven, then there would be a fornicator in heaven, would there not? If he's going to heaven, then he's going to go in his fornication because they died in their fornication. But my friends, he cannot go to heaven. Rather, he will go to hell. How do you say that? Well, Revelation 21 and verse 8 says that. But for the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and all idolaters and all liars, they shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That, my friends, is everlasting punishment. Let us be warned. We can so act as to fall from the grace of God. What will become of the soul that sinneth? When we ask that to the Bible, we find the answer in Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of his father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. In verse 21 through 24 of that same Ezekiel 18, he said, But if the wicked turn from his sins that he hath committed, and keep my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his transgressions that he hath committed which shall be remembered against him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, saith the Lord, Jehovah, and not rather that he should return from his way and live? But... When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abomination of the wicked, that man shall die. None of his righteous deeds that he hath done shall be remembered. And in his trespass he sh which he hath trespassed and in his sin which he hath sinned, in them shall he die. That, my friends, makes it very clear, does it not? The principles of truth throughout the Bible teach that a man can fall from grace. Can a righteous man sin? We've just read it. Can one who sins 
while he is in sin, can he die in that sin? Well, let's read the words of our Lord. In John 8, 21, he said, I said unto you that I go away and ye shall seek me and ye shall die in your sin. Verse 24, I said unto you, ye shall die in your sin. For except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Well, what will become of the hope of a godless man? If one is godless, if he refused to live in harmony with God's will, that makes a godless man, then what shall become of that man? In Job the 8th chapter and verse 13, he said, So the paths of all who forget God and the hope of the godless shall perish. What's going to happen to the godless man? His hope shall perish. In Jeremiah 8 and verse 15, when the people departed from Jehovah, he allowed the Chaldeans to overtake them and overpower them. And they said, we looked for peace, but no good came. And for a, a time of healing, but behold, dismay. Well, this really expresses the fact, doesn't it? That a child of God, a righteous man, if he sins, he can die in his sins. We know for sure that Simon did. In Acts the 8th chapter, he would have died in his sin had he not repented. But he asked Peter, pray God that the thought of my heart may be forgiven me. And Peter did so remember him so far as we know. In 1 John 1, 9, there he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. Peter did. He was a righteous man who sinned. He denied the Lord, denied he knew him, even cursed at his trial. My friends, he was one who returned unto Jehovah and preached the first gospel sermon both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. In Galatians 2, Peter again sinned. He withdrew from those uh, Gentiles when the Jews came up, and Paul said, I rebuked him to the face because he stood condemned. Well, we understand then that the righteous people can sin, and if they die in that sin then certainly they're going to go to the wrong place. Demas, of course, was one whom Paul called his fellow servant. Demas, my fellow servant. And then in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, Paul talked about Demas being his fellow heir or his fellow servant of God. But then he says also, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, if he died in his sin, what would happen? Well, he would be lost, would he not? And that proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that a man can fall from the grace of God and be eternally lost. What will become of the hopes of a godless man? They shall perish. Can God's people forget him? Oh, yes. In Jeremiah 2 and verse 32, he said, Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. If we forget Jehovah... What shall be the end of the one who forgets the Lord? Psalms 9 and verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned in, uh, back into Sheol, even all nations that forget God. Our nation, of course, is getting close to forgetting God. Our nation is headed in a downhill spiral. The morals of our nation are not good, and we need to turn it back while opportunity is ours. Well, let us then look even further. Since people can forget the Lord, then what about those? Well, if they forget God, they shall be turned into hell. Can a child of God call his brother a fool uh, for without a cause? Yes, evidently he can. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. My friends, this is talking about brethren. When we say to a brother, Raka, or stupid, or we might say blockhead, then we are really in danger here. But if we say unto a brother, Thou fool, and there's one who acts contrary to right reasoning, then he says, they shall be in danger of hell fire. Now this is hell fire, Gehenna. Gehenna means that eternal punishment of the wicked. So a child of God can't call his brother a fool 
Some have called us knuckleheads at times. That's the same thing. And they, if they refuse to repent, are in contempt and in danger of hellfire. Well, Adam and Eve, of course, fell in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2.16, Jehovah God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Why did God not want Adam and Eve to partake of that fruit? I don't know why. He doesn't give us a reason why. But I know one thing for sure. It was a test of their obedience. And since they did not obey, you remember that God drove them out of that garden. So, that being true, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3 says, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, and by the way, that was in her purity, she was a pure one in the sight of God at that time, but the serpent beguiled her through his subtlety, through his arts, so he said, I would fear lest your minds be corrupted, that is, alienated in affection from the simplicity, the doctrine, the worship, the true gospel of Christ that is in Christ, from the simplicity that is in Christ. Oh, how wonderful the simplicity in Christ is when we see his will and obey it. But if we are beguiled, if we are turned away from the simplicity which is in Christ, alienated in our affections from God, then what? Well, my friends, we understand that will not be good for us. Christians' names, of course, are written in heaven. Hebrews 12, 23 through 29, he said, You've come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God. And he said, Your names are enrolled in heaven. Isn't that great? One who has heard the gospel, believed it, repented of his sins, confess the name of Christ and be baptized into Christ. That man is a Christian. He is a saint. He's been set apart to the service of God. But my friends, it's also true that his name is enrolled in heaven. In what book was Clement and others' names found? Philippians 4 and verse 3 said, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Now, these women who helped Paul was not, were not public preachers because no public preacher was a woman in the Bible. No, they were forbidden to speak in the public assembly. But we find that way, in ways appropriate they had served God. Now, that, my friend, says that these women, as well as Clement, and also other fellow laborers, their names are written in the book of life. Well, what becomes of those whose names are not written in the book of life? Revelation 21, 27 says, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that is defiled, that defileth, neither he whosoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Who are these? Well, they're not the liars. They're not those who commit abominations against God. They're not those which defile, but they are those who are faithful Christians who are fitted for glory. They're the ones whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, he said, I testify unto every man to hear the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the tree of life and out of the holy city which are written in this book. Now, my friends, we must not add to the Bible nor take from it. And it would be adding to, would it not, to say, here's the security of the believer. He can't fall from grace. Once he's saved, he's always saved. Well, there's just one thing wrong with that. It's just the doctrines of men and not that which the Lord has taught us. In Revelation 20 and verse 15, he said, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's eternal destruction. That will be their eternal abode. Well, who will God blot out of his book? In Exodus 23 and verse 33, we learn there that Jehovah God said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, 
Him will I blot out of my book. My friends, if we've sinned against God, we can realize and know that we will be blotted out of his book of life. Whosoever hath sinned against me, that's God. Now let me ask another question. Who are the branches in the vine? In John 15, verses 1 through 4, there we find the Lord saying, I am the true vine. That indicates there's some false vines. But he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. And every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. But every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh it away. Now he said, Already are ye clean because of the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, neither can ye except ye abide in me. He said, Now if these branches are taken away from the vine, they're withered, and the angels will gather them up and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Who are these branches? Verse 6 says they're men. Some people say, oh, the branches are different denominational churches. No, no, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. No, these are the men who are gathered up because they did not bear any fruit in the vine. Now, if we're connected to Christ, who is the vine, he said, I'm the true vine. Then we have obeyed the gospel, been added to that vine, and we are to produce fruit for the Lord. Well, some say these were just water sprouts or pretended branches. Is that true? No, my friends, it's not. Verse 6 again of John 15 says it is the men who did not bear any fruit. Well, where will a man go that is cast forth as a branch? Well, he said they're cast forth, withered, and burned. And so we know this will be eternal destruction. What can separate us from God? Iniquity and sin. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, he said, Behold, Jehovah's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face so that he will not hear. My friends, it's so important to learn the truth, isn't it? And I'm sure today that our study has helped those who are sincere in seeking the truth, and they want to know what is right. Can a child of God so live as to fall from grace? Indeed, without a doubt, that is true. We shall continue these thoughts on our next program. We're hopeful that you will be able to be with us then. If you have any questions or comments concerning these programs, please write to the GBN Broadcast Company. It's been such a pleasure to be with you, but now because of time, we must bid you a very pleasant good day.